For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. South Asia is home to some of ancient history's greatest civilizations. It was there that the Indus Valley Civilization arose, which had the earliest known standardized plumbing systems and earliest enclosed dockyards. It was the first to use the lost wax casting technique in metallurgy. They were the earliest cultivators of cotton. South Asia was the home of great political experimentation and great ancient empires such as the Mauryan Empire and the Gupta Empire. Sugar refinement, ink, glass blowing, and diamond cutting were all pioneered in India in ancient times. Indian mathematics described Fibonacci numbers before anyone else, employed the number zero before anyone else, and invented the Hindu numeral system, which is the basis of our own numeral system today. Their medical science and astronomical science were highly advanced. I've always loved studying ancient Indian history and have long been an admirer of the people of India. Our knowledge of the movements of various peoples in and out of India in the ancient period has increased with the advent of genetic studies. Great strides have been made in this field, and it is now being used in the reconstruction of ancient history. I want to share with you what we have learned to date on the subject of a migration into India that is thought to have occurred between 2000 and 1500 BCE. I refer specifically to the migration of Indo-Aryan peoples into northern India at that time. Indo-Aryan, if you don't know, is a language group, a subset of the larger Indo-European language family. So the term Indo-Aryans refers to people who speak Indo-Aryan languages. Now you might think, well, this sounds kind of boring. Listening to a discussion of migrating languages is about as interesting as watching paint dry. Ah, but this particular subject, yes indeed, an ancient history subject, has become a hot-button issue in India today. Passions run high on this one, and this seemingly innocuous topic has been politicized. We aren't going to politicize it here, but what we are going to do is look at what some people are saying about this, and then see if their claims are matching the genetic evidence or contradicting it. Welcome to the Myths of Ancient History series, in which I look at popular misinformation about the ancient past, usually as found on YouTube. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at a video by Abhijit Chabda, a theoretical physicist and information technologist who makes videos about history and other subjects. He comes across as an intelligent and reasonable fellow, but his alternative views on the topic of ancient Indo-Aryan migration contradict science. I realize that some of you are watching just because you like to learn about pseudo-historical positions from around the world, and that's fine. But maybe you are a person somewhat familiar with this topic and are on the fence about it and don't know what to believe. You're not personally tied to any one position, you just want to know the facts. So I will share with you the findings of genetic science on this subject as fairly and clearly as I can, and I hope it will help you sort things out. Before we begin, I have to give you a little background. Some of you may not be familiar with the topic much at all. What exactly is the theory of Indo-Aryan migration? Well, it's based on a corroboration of several interconnecting lines of evidence from linguistics, history, genetics, and archaeology. The theory is that between 2000 and 1500 BCE, early speakers of Indo-Aryan languages migrated into India from the northwest and settled there. This occurred over a few centuries. The main Indo-Aryan language at this time was Vedic Sanskrit, that is, the language in which the Vedas, the oldest surviving books of India, were composed. These compositions probably started out as oral, but then later were written down. The oldest of the Vedas is the Rig Veda. The speakers of Vedic Sanskrit intermingled with the indigenous inhabitants of northern India, and they influenced each other. The religion or spiritual way of life that developed at this time was taught by Brahmins, the priests and teachers of that society, and it spread. The Vedic system of beliefs developed into Hinduism. Those are the basics of the theory. Okay, so now let us see what Abhijit Chabda has to say. The video we will be looking at is called, I Used to Believe in the Aryan Invasion Myth. Until 2016, you'll be surprised to know, I was a firm believer in the Aryan Invasion Theory. I mean, I have been studying uh, 
in reading about history my entire life and every single book i read every single research paper or article i read they all supported the aryan invasion theory including books and uh, by by indian authors people like bal gangadhar tilak dayanand saraswati and and so many others if you're not familiar with the terminology you might be wondering what he means by the aryan invasion theory is that the same thing as the indo aryan migration i was just talking about No, it's not, though it does share a couple of things in common with it. The Aryan invasion theory was a theory prevalent in scholarship in the late 19th and early 20th century. It proposed that the Indus Valley civilization had been inhabited by Dravidians, that is speakers of Dravidian languages, which now are mostly found in southern India. But then the civilization was conquered by invading chariot driving Aryans. These Aryans, which were envisioned as a light-skinned racial group originating in Europe, subjugated the area and drove the Dravidians southward. This theory, as you might imagine, was used by some to argue that light-skinned people dominated dark-skinned people in ancient India and that they were superior to them. What is the difference between Aryans and Indo-Aryans? In this context, nothing really. Aryan is sometimes used as shorthand for Indo-Aryan. and i myself have used it as such in the past but the preferred term among linguists today is indo-aryan and so that is what i will use to name this linguistic group from now on plus aryan has been used by some as a racial epithet and i don't want to confuse people by using it we are talking about a language family now here's the important point to remember mainstream scholarship discarded the aryan invasion theory decades ago I don't know how old Abhijit is and what school he went to maybe the textbooks were outdated but the important thing to remember is that it has long been debunked and yet he's bringing it up as if it were actively taught in today's universities or by modern scholars it isn't so making a video about how you've determined that the Aryan invasion theory is wrong is a bit strange it's kind of like making a video that you've discovered that the earth isn't flat so everybody supported the aryan invasion theory so and and there was a great deal of scientific evidence as well there is the genetic evidence that links indians to uh, people from europe there is the linguistic evidence that links india the ancient languages of india with the modern languages of europe and every single researcher every single historian they all drew the conclusion that this is an invasion that came from eastern europe or central asia into india and into europe and this is how we have these uh, connections There is a great deal of scientific evidence in support of the Indo-Aryan migration into India, but not so much for the Aryan invasion theory. I took a look at Abhijit's website and he gives a decent description of the Aryan invasion theory. The Aryan invasion theory, AIT, needs no introduction. It is the bedrock upon which Indian history has been written. Well, not anymore it isn't. Its central thesis has three main components. 1. India's original inhabitants were dark-skinned Dravidians who built a peaceful, highly developed, near-utopian urban civilization in western India and present-day Pakistan, the so-called Harappan or Indus Valley civilization. Scholars today don't say that India's original inhabitants were Dravidians. They do say that Dravidians or proto-Dravidians were there early on along with speakers of other languages. As for the Indus Valley civilization, which no historian characterizes as a peaceful near utopia, its language is acknowledged to be unknown. The proposal that it was Dravidian is made by some, but it is not a necessary component of the Indo-Aryan migration theory. 2. India was invaded and conquered from the west by a nomadic people called the Indo-Aryans around 1500 BCE. These Indo-Aryans were of European origin. hence white skinned and spoke vedic sanskrit they destroyed the indigenous dravidian civilization subjugated the natives and forced them to migrate to india south this idea which is the main part of the theory has been dropped indo aryans are no longer believed to be of european origin no invasion of the indus valley civilization is detectable and in fact archaeology suggests that the cities were abandoned rather than destroyed scholars agree there was no massive invasion 3 the indo-aryans then composed the vedas and imposed hinduism and the caste system upon the hapless dravidians and other indigenous peoples of india scholars still accept that the vedas were composed in sanskrit an indo-aryan language 
well, obviously, but it is no longer the consensus that the religion of the Brahmins, or a caste system, was forced on people, or that the caste system was based on skin color. It likely was based originally on profession. First propounded by Max Mueller, the AIT has been regarded as self-evident since the 19th century. He speaks as if it were still alive and well. With all three of these main tenets rejected, it can rightly be said that the Aryan invasion theory is dead, and has been for quite a while. In the late 20th century, it was refined into what is now known as the Indo-Aryan Migration Theory, IAMT. According to this model, the Indo-Aryans migrated into India rather than invaded it, which nevertheless had the same effect on the indigenous peoples, their subjugation and the imposition of Indo-Aryan religion, Hinduism, and culture. That last part isn't true, but notice what he did here. He made the effort to lay out for his audience the central tenets of the Aryan invasion theory, which are no longer held by scholars to be true, and then says something akin to, and the new theory is not much different. He treats the two theories together as part of a single conceptual whole, even though they contain elements that differ essentially in nature, factuality, and importance. If he's supposed to be arguing against a current theory, then the honest thing to do would be to lay out the central components of the current theory. But he didn't do that. Why? I don't know. But I will say this. The name Aryan Invasion Theory sounds more objectionable than Indo-Aryan Migration. And it is associated with European colonialism, which links it with oppression. And it is also easier to debunk. If you lump the two together, then whatever you say about Aryan Invasion, people will assume it applies to Indo-Aryan Migration too. It's very convenient. Maybe it's a rhetorical strategy. So I saw no reason to not believe it because everybody, every eminent historian, every scientist, they all unanimously agreed with this theory. The Aryan invasion theory? They don't anymore. As for the theory of Indo-Aryan migration, yes, this is the mainstream view. In other words, it is supported by a supermajority of historians, archaeologists, uh, geneticists, and linguists all around the world including in India. Now, you might wonder, why would anyone have a problem with the theory of a simple migration? I don't get it. I'm by no means an expert on Indian politics or religion, but here's what I've been able to determine. And if I get any of this wrong, Abhijit or someone else with first-hand knowledge of this can correct me. It is chiefly Hindu nationalists who have a problem with this. These would be conservative Hindus, not all Hindus. And their issue is not with the idea of migration in general. I mean, there have been many migrations into India in history, and none of these cause as much offense as this particular one does. So, for example, many acknowledge that there were migrations into India prior to the Indo-Aryan migration, prehistoric ones. And then there are later migrations that are acknowledged as well. Greeks, Huns, Mughals, etc., who migrated into India. So, why is this one an issue? Well, it has to do with the origins of Hinduism. If the Vedas, the earliest compositions of the Hindu faith, are in Sanskrit, an Indo-Aryan language, and the speakers of this language didn't arrive in India until after 2000 BCE, then that means Hinduism in India cannot predate 2000 BCE. But for some, Hinduism is both native to India and the world's oldest extant religion. An Indo-Aryan migration would not allow for that. There may be other reasons why this theory does not appeal to certain persons, but from what I can tell, this is the chief concern. And if I misrepresented the position in any way, I apologize, but I don't think I said anything controversial. And I was aware that there were certain Indian voices that were in, in opposition to this theory. I had heard about this out of India theory, and I frankly found it embarrassing. What is the out-of-India theory? It is the belief that Indo-Aryans are indigenous to India and that, in fact, all Indo-European languages originated there and that the people of the Indus Valley civilization spoke Vedic Sanskrit. This proposal comes in varied forms, but pretty much the only place you will hear it defended is in conservative Hindu circles. I, my attitude was very simple. We know that we that humanity came out of Africa. So how does it matter 
that whether there was an invasion from by the Aryans from Europe or not. We are all migrants. So why do we have to oppose everything? Why do why do Indians, especially especially Hindu nationalists, have to say that everything came out of India? That was my position on this. I found this opposition to the Aryan invasion theory very embarrassing. There are understandable reasons why Abhijit was at one time embarrassed about the out of India theory. For one, it was invented by amateur researchers with a vested interest, not by historians, archaeologists, or other subject experts. Mind you, in India, there is an archaeologist here or there, or a geneticist here or there, that might express some sympathy with it from time to time. But by and large, it does not derive from professionals in the fields involved. Not only is it not accepted in mainstream scholarship, it isn't even taken seriously. You won't find it in secular peer-reviewed journals. Let me state right off the bat here that I came to this subject with no vested interest in the outcome of my research. Where Indo-Aryans originated, whether in India or anywhere else, when they moved here or there, none of that matters to me personally. All I care about is getting history correct. If it is discovered that Indo-Aryans are indigenous to India, I'm fine with it. And that is what we should encourage in historical investigation. Go where the evidence leads without regard for any personal feelings on the matter. Consider all sides of an argument. Don't brush any evidence or argument under the rug when it doesn't match with the conclusion you want to be true, right? And I hope that Abhijit is not so invested in his current position that he won't be willing to do that too. Most of what he talks about in his video is the genetic evidence, so that is what we will stick to today. If people want me to do separate videos on the linguistic evidence and archaeological evidence, then at some point in the future, I will. I touched a bit on the genetic evidence in my Did Civilization Begin in India video, which you can check out at your leisure, but I didn't have the time to go into it in depth, and now I will. A few basics about the use of genetics in the reconstruction of history and its connection to language. The geographical distribution of the language groups within India is largely non-overlapping. In southern India are the Dravidian-speaking groups, in northern India you have the Indo-Aryan speakers, and in northeastern India are the Tibeto-Burman speakers. Then you have the numerically small tribal groups of eastern and central India who speak Austroasiatic languages. They have no written form of language and practice traditional modes of subsistence. There is overwhelming anthropological and genomic evidence that these tribal people are the oldest inhabitants of India. Culturally speaking, most people in India belong to either tribal or caste societies. It's been estimated that there are over 400 tribal groups and over 4,000 caste groups. Hindu society is composed of castes, and their languages are written. Geneticists have determined that linguistic differences of populations in South Asia provide the best explanation of genetic differences observed there. Now, let's take a look at the genetic evidence Abhijit presents which he says changed his mind about Indo-Aryan migration into India. Now, then what happened is that I recently uh, came across some new research about an invasion of Europe that happened about 5,000 years ago. So there was this bunch of horse-riding men, extremely violent men, who invaded Europe from the east about 5,000 years ago, and they committed an absolute genocide in Europe. They wiped out every single European male and they took all the females as their uh, reproductive partners. And in a very brief period of time, the entire older Euro European male genetics were wiped out. And today's Europeans are the descendants of these new invaders from 5,000 years ago and the older European women. You might be wondering why he's talking about an invasion of Europe when we're supposed to be talking about a migration into India. It's because he's trying to draw a comparison that will become apparent in a few minutes. So, so I, I saw this, this research. Let me show you some. I have spoken about this before. So this is one of the headlines. The most violent group of people who ever lived. Horse riding Yamnaya tribe used their huge height and muscular build to brutally murder and invade their way across Europe more than 4,000 years ago. So this is one headline. This is another headline. The most murderous people of all time revealed in ancient DNA. This was a violent conquest of, of Europe. And genetic analysis tells the tale for the first time. This was from 2019. But this news started coming in in research papers from 2015, I think, onwards. Here's one more. Stored age genocide. Vengeful prehistoric invaders who changed Europe forever. The scientific papers Abhijit seems to be referring to are, first, 
Massive Migration from the Steppe was a source for Indo-European languages in Europe. Written by a team of geneticists headed by David Reich in 2015, the study found that Europe was inhabited initially by hunter-gatherers, then two major migrations into Europe took place. First, the arrival of the first farmers from the Near East during the early Neolithic, and second, the arrival of pastoralists from Yamnaya from the steppe during the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age. They associated the movement of the Yamnaya with the spread of Indo-European languages. Then two studies undertaken by a team led by Eski Villerslev, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, were published called Population Genomics in Bronze Age Eurasia and Retheorizing Mobility and the Formation of Culture and Language Among the Corded Ware Culture in Europe. The first found that the Bronze Age was a highly dynamic period involving large-scale population migrations and replacements responsible for shaping major parts of present-day demographic structure in both Europe and Asia. They concluded that their findings were consistent with the hypothesized spread of Indo-European languages during the early Bronze Age. The second paper examined the formation of the Corded Ware culture between 2800 and 2400 BCE, which was formed through a hybridization of Yamnaya men with Neolithic women. The women married into Yamnaya settlements, dominated by males of first-generation migrants. The original herding economy of the Yamnaya migrants gradually gave way to crop cultivation, which led to the adaptation of new words. The scientists characterized the process as peaceful interaction and intermarriage between culturally and genetically different groups, which were interspersed with episodes of conflict. Then what about all this talk of the Yamnaya people as murderous and committers of genocide? Where's he getting that from? Not from the scientific papers. An archaeologist named Chris Christensen, who was involved in the last two studies, is the source of this claim. He has a theory that the Yamnaya people committed genocide when they entered Europe and his comments got spread in the media. But this view is not widely accepted because he draws far-reaching conclusions from a small amount of evidence. It's not a consensus position. And his thesis is an archaeological one. He's not a geneticist. As far as I can tell, there are zero genetic studies that conclude there was a genocide or that the Yamnaya were particularly murderous. So essentially we find this sudden shift in European genetics. It's a clear indication of genocide wide-scale genocide, the entire genetic makeup, the patrilineal lineages change overnight almost in Europe. So this is a sudden influx of foreign genes. And of course, there, there is a corresponding change in, in the kind of pottery and uh, cultural artifacts that you have. So everything changed all of a sudden, not just the genetics, but also the pottery, also the cultural artifacts, also the kind of uh, uh, burial goods you have, the kind of burial rituals you have and all that. And also you find this widespread evidence of, of massacres. As you can see, this is a mass grave. A number of people dumped together into a pit and buried hastily without any ceremony, without any respect. So these are the older, the, pre, the original Europeans who were massacred in enormous quantities by these new horse riding invaders. The evidence for these massacres is not widespread. The evidence for it is restricted chiefly to one area and is not seen in other places that the Yamnaya people went. So it can't be used as representative of the Yamnaya people as a whole. So I found this very interesting that this sort of a thing had, hap had happened in Europe. And I also found that these same Yamnaya invaders were supposed to have brought the Aryan genes into India, right? So I found this very curious. I found it very interesting. Wait, so what's the point? Well, he seems to be reasoning that if these Indo-Europeans invaded Europe in such a violent way, then they must have invaded India in the same violent way. But there's no evidence for a violent invasion into India. Therefore, an Indo-Aryan migration must not have happened. But of course, such reasoning assumes a consistency in the way that a genetic group behaves towards other people. A sort of genetic essentialism or ethnic essentialism. Clearly, people from the same genetic group are perfectly capable of behaving differently in different circumstances and in different parts of the world. So such an argument, if that's what he's saying, would be fallacious. I went back over the genetic studies that have been done since 2006 and have compiled the data. Let's go over it and see what the geneticists have learned. A study in 2006 with 15 contributing geneticists sought to determine what genetic haplogroups originated in South Asia. 
This was a Y chromosome study. That means paternal lineages. A haplogroup, in case you don't know, is a combination of alleles, that is, gene variants, that are closely linked and tend to be inherited together. The main discovery of the study was that haplogroups associated with Dravidian languages originated in India. These would be haplogroups R2M124 and L1M76. Also determined plausibly to have arisen in India were haplogroups C5M356, FM89, and HM69. The haplogroup R1A1, which is linked to speakers of Indo-European languages, was found to have a much more complex history. The study found that the considerable age of Y microsatellite variation of R1A1 and their spatial frequency plots do not support the claim that their presence among tribes today, the original indigenous inhabitants, could be due to occasional recent admixture only. In other words, influx of R1A1 has occurred at multiple points throughout South Asia's history and not just from the time of a presumed Indo-Aryan migration forward. Our overall inference, they write, is that an early Holocene expansion in northwestern India, including the Indus Valley, contributed R1A1 M17 chromosomes both to the Central Asian and South Asian tribes prior to the arrival of the Indo-Europeans. They do not conclude that there was no entry of R1A1 into India in later times, only that it also occurred earlier. Commenting on a proposed immigration of Indo-Aryans into India from Central Asia, they write, Although any recent immigration from Central Asia would have undoubtedly contributed some R haplogroups to the pre-existing gene pool, other potential events could have also contributed significantly to the observed distributions, both in India and in Central Asia. In other words, there is no evidence whatsoever to conclude that Central Asia has been necessarily the recent donor and not the receptor of the R1 lineages. This last statement could be taken out of context to mean that the study was concluding that R1A1 lineages originated in India and expanded into Central Asia, but it is clear from reading the whole study that the scientists were suggesting something more complex where movement was going both ways. Yes, R1A first entered India very early, but also R1A that far back is not necessarily and probably not likely to be linked with Indo-European languages. Another study published in the same year examined mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA for short, that is, maternal lineages. This one concluded that the M macro haplogroup, which harbors more than 60% of the Indian mtDNA lineage, originated in India. To this day, it appears to be acknowledged universally among geneticists that M started in India and that no significant matrilineal DNA has come from outside of South Asia. It was the patrilineal DNA that was being debated at this time. In 2009, a more limited study from Sharma et al. came out, the work of 10 geneticists. The purpose of the study was to determine the origins of the caste system. It was a Y chromosome study focusing on paternal lineages. As you can see from the title, it concluded that the caste known as Brahmins, that is the priestly caste, who have a high frequency of R1A1, are the originators of the R1A1 haplogroup. To date, this is the only genetic study that has concluded R1A1 arose in India. The reasoning is based on the fact that haplogroups frequently found in Central Asia were not present in the DNA samples from Brahmins, and the fact that there was greater diversity of R1A1 in Indians than in Central Asians or Europeans. However, the scientists conducting the study made clear that their conclusions were tentative, writing, however, there is a scanty representation of Y haplogroup R1A1 subgroups in the literature as well as in this study. The known subgroups, R1A1A, R1A1B, and R1A1C, which are defined by binary markers M56, M157, or M87, respectively, were not observed. In other words, they were not part of the study. In such a situation, it is likely that this haplogroup, R1A1, is a polyphyletic or paraphyletic group of Y lineages. It is therefore very important to discover novel Y chromosomal binary markers for defining monophyletic subhaplogroups belonging to YR1A1 with a higher resolution to confirm the present conclusion. They also wrote, There is an immense need of phylogenetic explorations in the northernmost Himalayan regions of India, which might have acted as an incubator of many ancient lineages, to obtain a clearer picture 
of the peopling of India and Eurasia. Fortunately, forthcoming work on the northern regions of India will be done, and it will change things. This is one of Abhijit's favorite studies, as you might imagine. Here is what he says about R1A in another video. So for those of you who don't know, R1A is a genetic lineage. It's a patrilineal genetic lineage. It's called a haplogroup in genetic terminology. So it's a lineage that is passed on from father to son. It's a specific genetic mutation. And uh, the uh, genetic uh, research shows that this lineage is at least 15 to 20,000 years old. And there is a lot of controversy about where it has originated. And the reason for the controversy is this, that R1A is the world's most successful extended family. It's the most successful genetic lineage that is known to humankind. Its population today is probably more than 1 billion people. And there are two clusters, geographical clusters, where most of these people of this particular lineage live. One is the Indian subcontinent. And the other one is uh, Eastern Europe and Northern Europe. So Poland, Germany, uh, Ukraine, Russia, that, that area. So these are two clusters, geographical clusters, where you find the majority of the males who have this specific genetic lineage. Now the question, so therefore historians and geneticists, etc., have hypothesized that this particular genetic lineage is the one that is associated with the spread of Indo-European languages and culture. So in essence, the people who originally carried this lineage are the original Aryan invaders. Just to be more precise, it's R1A1, a subclade of R1A, which is associated with Indo-Aryans. It's important to make that distinction because while it would be correct to say that Indo-Aryans are identified with R1A, it would be incorrect to say that R1A is identified with Indo-Aryans. And that uh, the, the, the theory is that these people invaded India about two and a half thousand, about, about three thousand years, three and a half thousand years before present from Eastern Europe and from Central Asia. So that is the prevailing consensus opinion among eminent historians right now. So there are a number of questions about it. First of all, there is no evidence of where this particular lineage has originated from. So every genetic lineage has a certain geographical origin. And how do we determine the origin? We find the region where there is the most genetic diversity within that lineage. So the question is, where do we find the most genetic diversity within the R1A lineage? And it is most likely to be India. Looking at the two clusters, a logical conclusion would be that the haplogroup originated somewhere between them. But Abhijit calls attention to the fact that India has the greatest genetic diversity in R1A. And this is what the Sharma paper concluded. This is true. And in genetics, it is posited that all other things being equal, the place with the greatest diversity is likely the place of origin. However, there are factors that can offset this. Geneticist Partha Majumdar puts it this way, Genetic diversity within a geographical area is a reasonable indicator of the age of the population's residence in that area. However, it is also dependent on the effective sizes of populations, implying thereby that the assessment of antiquity may not be straightforward. India has an extremely high population density, and that may be the reason for the diversity. So the observation of genetic diversity alone is not enough to establish that India is the home of R1A. In 2012, a study appeared that took into account 4,460 haplotypes of R1A across a huge swath of territory, stretching all the way from South Siberia, Northern China, through Central Asia, through South Asia, and the Iranian Plateau and Asia Minor to the Balkans. It concluded the results of this study lend a support to the theory that haplogroup R1A originated in Central Asia apparently in South Siberia or the neighboring regions. So there is research being done right now within India by geneticists. Uh, some research is being done. A lot of research is being done. Some papers will be published hopefully soon. And 
what is most likely going to happen, what is most likely going to emerge from this research is that India is the homeland of the R1A lineage, which would, com which would completely reverse the narrative that is uh, currently prevailing, that the Aryans invaded India from the West. If R1A is the homeland, if India is the homeland of the R1A lineage, it would indicate that the expansion of R1A happened from outs from within India outwards to the West. Therefore, it would mean that there was an Aryan invasion, but from India into Europe. I don't know if Abhijit has access to insider information, or he's just hoping that future studies will vindicate the conclusion that R1A originated in India. We will see, and certainly views will change with new results. However, usually new studies add information to that which we have already gathered. Rarely do they completely contradict previously collected data, which they would definitely have to do in order for us to conclude that R1A originated in India. In the same year the Sharma study was published, David Reich, working with four other geneticists, published preliminary findings of a much larger study they were conducting. It included not only Y chromosomes, but also mtDNA. It was revealed that modern-day Indians come from two main ancestral populations, which the geneticists designated as Ancestral North Indians, ANI, and Ancestral South Indians, ASI. This terminology is used to this day. Ancestral North Indians refers to an ancestral population that was genetically close to Middle Easterners, Central Asians, and Europeans, and which is found in a higher percentage in Northern India. And Ancestral South Indians refers to an ancestral population found in a higher percentage in Southern India. The study found that ANI ancestry is significantly higher in Indo-European than Dravidian speakers, suggesting that the ancestral ASI may have spoken a Dravidian language before mixing with the ANI. It also found significantly more ANI ancestry in traditionally upper than in lower or middle caste groups. And that traditional caste level is significantly correlated to ANI ancestry, even after controlling for language, suggesting a relationship between the history of caste formation in India and ANI-ASI mixture. So once I started looking into the genetics, I found very interesting and very surprising things. I found that when the out-of-Africa migration happened, the first place where humanity settled down was India. There most certainly was an early major migration into India, and it was there that the origin of many haplogroups can be traced, but not R1A. And, and more than 90% of the entire world's, entire world's non-African males have, are descended from an ancient Indian patrilineal genetic lineage, haplogroup F. So more than 90% of all non-African men who are alive in the world today are descended from an ancient Indian genetic lineage, haplogroup F. This is a patrilineal lineage which originated about, uh, about 60, 65,000 years ago in India. Remember, the migrations we are talking about would have occurred only about 4,000 years ago. So why has he gone so far back in time? I don't know. I don't understand what this is supposed to prove. Look at the map he's pointing to. As you can see, haplogroup F is shown as originating in India. And you can see the haplogroups that later came out of F. F, for example, leads to K, which leads to K2, we're outside of India now, which leads to P, which leads to R, which leads to R1A. Now, I don't know what scientific studies this map is based on, but it looks to me like R1A didn't originate in India, but in Central Asia. I also discovered after that, that more than 95% of all non-African women who are alive in the world today are also descended from two or three Indian genetic lineages, haplogroup M, N, and R, which uh, the oldest of which arose in India between 65 and 75,000 years before today. So, so this tells us that India was the original founders zone, foundation zone of the out of Africa movement. It is from India that all other non-African populations were populated. So India is the ancestral region of all, almost all non-African humans today. I found this very surprising. He never explains how any of this has a bearing on Indo-Aryan migration. By the time the migration would have occurred, 
many humans would have by this time left South Asia. For this to have any impact on the question at hand, one would have to suppose that Sanskrit was spoken as far back as 65,000 years ago, and all the non-African languages came from it. Oh, maybe he is supposing that. But that would be quite an assumption. There's no evidence for it, and it would contradict the findings of linguistics. There's nothing in anything he just said that contradicts the idea that paternal haplogroup R1A1 originated outside of India. And yet he's framing it as the proof that made him change his mind. Finding out that a significant number of haplogroups, which aren't R1A1, originated in India, in itself isn't something that would change anyone's mind about Indo-Aryan migration, because it has nothing to do with it. When I researched some more uh, ancient genet I mean, genetic papers, I found that there is almost no, there is completely negligible gene flow from outside into India in the past 10, 15,000 years. Negligible. Okay, so this is more relevant. If there was negligible gene flow into India in the past 10 to 15,000 years, then a significant number of Indo-Aryan men couldn't have entered in that period. Abhijit is probably invoking the 2006 study I mentioned earlier, which found evidence of only minor genetic influence from Central Asian pastoralists in India. But it was a tentative conclusion based on limited evidence. He also seems to be referring to a study that was published in 2011, which compared genetic information of South Asians, Central Asians, and West Eurasians. The part of the study that got the most attention was the conclusion that since no significant East Asian ancestry has been found in Indian populations, any Central Asian influx of genes into India must have occurred prior to the appearance of East Asian ancestry components in Central Asia. And that would be long before the presumed date of an Indo-Aryan migration. Nevertheless, that study avoided any simplistic conclusions. Our results confirm both ancestry and temporal complexity shaping the still ongoing process of genetic structuring of South Asian populations. This intricacy cannot be readily explained by the putative recent influx of Indo-Aryans alone, but suggests multiple gene flows to the South Asian gene pool, both from the West and East over a much longer time span. In 2012, an article summarizing the genetic science on India's populations appeared. Two of the authors, Lalji Singh and Kumarasamy Thangaraj, had been part of the Matspalu study. The most notable thing about this article is a small section in which they comment on, quote, the Aryan invasion, unquote. The authors write, The shared genetic affinity between the ANI component of northern India and West Eurasia was dated prior to the Aryan invasion. And they cite the Matspalu article. That's the article I just shared with you. These realities suggest the rejection of the Aryan invasion hypothesis, but support an ancient demographic history of India. Note that the authors of this article are basing this statement on the study I just shared with you. The conclusions of the Matspalu study were tentative, but these authors are less cautious in their wording. Strangely, they refer to it as the Aryan invasion hypothesis. Now, of course, geneticists are not likely to be familiar with the latest information in archaeology, history, or linguistics, so I suppose we should allow for their outdated terminology. But the statement is strangely far-reaching for a science article. It was still too early to make any definite claims, because genetic samples from certain areas were still lacking. The following year, 2013, the largest study ever done on this subject was published. And this one I think Abhijit is less enamored with. But the two scientists who helped write the previous article, Thangaraj and Singh, were part of it. This was the research project headed by David Reich, the preliminary findings of which we looked at earlier. There were significant revelations in this study. The geneticists assembled genome-wide data for 571 individuals from 73 well-defined ethno-linguistic groups from South Asia and found that nearly all groups experienced major mixture in the last few thousand years. The study found that the average date for admixture of Indo-Europeans into the population was 72 generations, assuming 29 years per generation, that is 2,088 years. The average for Dravidians was 108 generations, that's 3,132 years. Now, it's important to keep in mind that those are averages. The average can be affected by more recent immigration to some extent. But there is no doubt that there has been major genetic mixing in the last few thousand years. No doubt about it. The study specifically says major mixture between populations in India occurred 
1,900 to 4,200 years before the present. The explanation given for why the date of the admixture of Indo-Europeans is younger than that of Dravidians is that after an original mixture event of ANI and ASI that contributed to all present-day Indians, some northern groups received additional gene flow from groups with high proportions of West Eurasian ancestry, bringing down their average mixture date. It is important to note, however, that this additional gene flow did not necessarily come from the outside. It could be that for some time, the different populations in India didn't intermingle very much, and then did, and then they stopped again later. There was a bit of debate among the geneticists working on the study about this. Some of them supposed that these findings supported the idea of a people coming in from the outside, while Thangaraj and Singh argued against. They appealed to the Metzpalu study, which suggested no major genetic influx from Central Asia after 12,500 years ago. So a compromise statement was put into the study. Although we have documented evidence for mixture in India between about 1,900 and 4,200 years before present, this does not imply migration from West Eurasia into India during this time. On the contrary, a recent study, that's the Matspalu study, that searched for West Eurasian groups most closely related to the ANI ancestors of Indians failed to find any evidence for shared ancestry between the ANI and groups in West Eurasia within the past 12,500 years. Although it is possible that with further sampling and new methods, such relatedness might be detected. That last parenthetical leaves open the possibility that more data could overturn the conclusion of the Metzpalu study. And that is exactly what happened, as we will soon see. When we talk about the Yamnaya invasion of Europe, that's a complete replacement event. The male genetics are wiped out and a new replacement genetics is put in. So that, is, that is the Yamnaya invasion of Europe. But in the case of India, there is no such replacement event. The gene flow from outside is completely negligible in the past 10, 15,000 years. It is important to note that the Indo-Aryan migration theory does not suppose a replacement event. And we should not expect to find a replacement event just because an archaeologist thinks there was a replacement event in Europe. All we should expect to find is an introduction of new genetic material into South Asia, specifically R1A1, between 2000 and 1500 BCE. I also found that the uh, many genetic studies have, uh, have uh, demonstrated that North India, South India have essentially the same genetics, right? They may be similar now, but that has not always been the case. As the 2015 study showed, and I quote, our analysis documents major mixture between populations in India that occurred 1,900 to 4,200 years before present, well after the establishment of agriculture in the subcontinent. We have further shown that groups with unmixed ANI and ASI ancestry were plausibly living in India until this time. This contrasts with the situation today in which all groups in mainland India are admixed. And they are very clear about when this happened. The most remarkable aspect of the ANI-ASI mixture is how pervasive it was, in the sense that it has left its mark on nearly every group in India. It has affected not just traditionally upper caste groups, but also traditionally lower caste and isolated tribal groups, all of whom are united in their history of mixture in the past few thousand years. You see, the, the distance between northern India, let's say Kashmir or Afghanistan, and southern India is more than 3,000 kilometers. It's an enormous subcontinent. The distance between Sweden and Greece is less than that. And the people of Sweden look very different from the people of Greece, right? So similarly, in India also, we have this enormous genetic diversity, but all, it's a very ancient, some 60, 70,000 year old ancient genetic population. And that's why there is so much diversity in facial features, in height, in, in skin color, in eye color, hair color, and all that. Right? As has already been seen, it's simply not true that the population of India is genetically the same as it was thousands of years ago. It has already been established that ancestral North Indians and ancestral South Indians were more distinct at one time, and their admixture occurred within the past few thousand years. But let's get back to this question of whether anyone from the outside entered India within the past few thousand years. Now we get to the groundbreaking study 
that came out in 2019, which significantly increased our knowledge of the Central Asia-South Asia genetic connection and settled the question of whether any significant influx of Central Asian genetic material entered South Asia between 2000 and 1500 BCE. 108 specialists worked on this, the biggest undertaking yet. And they found that genes from the Central Asian steppes contributed up to 30% of the ancestry of modern groups of South Asia, and that this influx occurred between around 2000 and 1500 BCE. It thus became clear that the earlier Metzpalu study simply did not have enough genetic information at its disposal to accurately tell whether Central Asians contributed to the gene pool of India at that time. The new study reconstructed the genetic history of India as follows. First, we have the Indus periphery Klein, pre-2000 BCE, found in the Indus Valley. Okay, this is the Indus Valley civilization. Now, I do want to note that they had no DNA directly from the IVC, so they used DNA from two sites in cultural contact with it. The Indus periphery Klein consisted of a mix of two population groups, one, Andamanese hunter-gatherer related, and the other, mostly Iranian farmer related, 90%. Then we have ancestral ancient South Indians, pre-2000 BCE. These are people with South Asian ancestry with no West Eurasian component, and they were related to ancient East Asians and Australasians. Then, around 2000 BCE, we get the steppe Klein, found in northernmost India. These people were a mixture of the Indus periphery Klein, that's the first one above, with central steppe middle and late Bronze Age ancestry. In other words, Yamnaya ancestry. Steppe ancestry is significantly higher in males and in Brahmins. And then we have our ancestral South Indians and ancestral North Indians, whom we talked about. The ASI was formed between 1700 and 1400 BCE by the mixture of AASI, that's the second one above, and the Indus periphery Klein, that's the first one. And we have the ANI formed between 1900 and 1500 BCE by a mixture of the steppe Klein, that's the third one, with the Indus periphery Klein, that's the first one. The study concludes, our results not only provide negative evidence against an Iranian plateau origin for Indo-European languages in South Asia, but also positive evidence for the theory that these languages spread from the steppe. We thus concede that the genetic evidence has added support to the linguistic argument that Indo-European languages, and specifically the Indo-Aryan branch, was brought to South Asia from the steppes of Central Asia. Interestingly, the study also draws a conclusion about the language spoken in the Indus Valley civilization. Quote, the strong correlation between ASI ancestry and present-day Dravidian languages suggests that the ASI, which we have shown formed as groups with ancestry typical of the Indus periphery Klein, move south and east after the decline of the IVC to mix with groups with more AASI ancestry, most likely spoken early Dravidian language. A possible scenario combining genetic data with archaeology and linguistics is that proto-Dravidian was spread by peoples of the IVC along with the Indus periphery Klein ancestry component of the ASI. It would seem that genetics supports the idea that the people of the IVC spoke a proto-Dravidian language. But I think it's worth pointing out that practically all Indians have a portion of genes from the Indus periphery Klein, and therefore have a line of descent from the Indus Valley Civilization. Then I also found that the Indus Valley Civilization is the oldest known civilization of all time, the oldest continuously existing civilization in its cultural traits are still present in India today. What we call Hinduism was, was practiced five, 6,000 years ago in the Sapta Sindhu region. There is so much evidence of cultural continuity. So if there was an invasion into India, how come this culture was not destroyed and there was a cultural discontinuity like we find in Europe? That's an easy one. It was never conquered. But everybody knows that already. Yes, many cultural characteristics of the IVC have lasted until today and other characteristics have not survived. And there are other cultural characteristics of modern India that are not traceable to the IVC. It's pretty much what we'd expect for a civilization that was not destroyed by an invading force. It still went into a decline, though, and its cities were abandoned. Speaking of the IVC, a supplement to the previous study came out the following month, which added a bit more info about the genetic makeup 
of the Indus Valley Civilization. In that last study, there was no actual genetic material that they could get from an IVC site, so they had to use material from somewhere nearby. But at the site of Rocky Gari, they did find some in the remains of a woman, and this confirmed a largely Iranian farmer ancestry. But the person also had some Southeast Asian ancestry. Oh, and it is probably worth pointing out that this in no way means that farming was brought to India from Iran. When they say they are related to Iranian farmers, they mean only that their ancestors and the Iranian farmers' ancestors were the same. Farming was already in India long before this. But something weird happened after this Rocky Gari study came out. Niraj Rai, one of the geneticists who worked on it, and the previous study too, said in a press conference, which was aimed at explaining the research, We share some kind of ancestry with the Iranians, but the ancestral population could be South Asian. We are finding the out-of-India theory. This proves it because in Shari Sokta and Goner in Iran, scientists in the West have analyzed 25 individuals and they have found that 10 to 12 individuals show different kinds of ancestry. When we generated Rakigari data and compared it, these two match completely the same ancestral gradient. This is giving a hint of OIT, that's out of India theory. More results are required, but at this moment, we can certainly say that OIT is probably there, unquote. What is he talking about? Well, there were some Iranian samples of DNA that matched the DNA of the Rocky Gari woman, and the paper offered some arguments that it was more likely that the Iranian people this DNA was taken from came from the IVC rather than the other way around. So Niraj Rai is presenting this as an out-of-India theory. And in a sense, yes, I guess you could say that people leaving the IVC to go to Iran is a movement out of India. But the question here is not whether people ever migrated out of India. I'm sure that happened all the time. The question is whether speakers of Indo-European languages came out of India or into India. There's nothing connecting these Iranians or the Rakigari woman with Indo-European language. So it isn't really OIT. And then where is the evidence of the massacres? If there was a Yamnaya invasion into India, and we know how brutal they were, and we know what they did in Europe, we know the genocide they perpetrated in Europe, we know all the mass graves and destruction. So why is it not seen in India? Where is it, right? Again, Indo-Aryan migration does not assume massacres, or population replacement, or subjugation. And so, so these are some of the things that tell us that there is something very fishy about this Aryan invasion theory. So we have evidence of cultural continuity. There is zero evidence of an invasion. There is zero evidence of a migration. And there is layer upon layer of archaeological, genetic, linguistic, literary, geological, hydrological, and all kinds of evidence that shows that India has been continuously inhabited by the same population for more than 60, 70,000 years. Well, as you have seen, there is genetic evidence of migration. As for the other forms of evidence, we can consider them at another time. But you can find some of that in my videos on Did Civilization Begin in India? So all of this taken together shocked me completely. It shook my entire whatever I believed until then. And after this, after seeing the actual scientific data, I have come to the very firm conclusion that the out of India theory is much more viable and much more consistent with the facts than any Aryan invasion or migration or tourism or picnic theory. We just looked at the scientific data too. Let me ask you, the viewer, do you think that Abhijit looked at the scientific evidence well enough? Do you think he looked at it objectively? So that is uh, why after seeing the evidence, after seeing the factual evidence, after studying it for a very long time, I came to the conclusion that this Aryan invasion theory is completely fake. And after, after seeing all this, uh, I wrote an article in 2017. So this is the article I wrote. It's in indiafacts.com. The title of the article is Aryan Invasion Myth, How 21st Century Science Debunks 19th Century Indology. So this is an article I published in 2017 in which I have given an entire detailed analysis of all the evidence that was available till 2017. So this is everything that I found until that time. Of course, I have done more research uh, subsequent to this, uh, to the publication of this article. Uh, so so <clears throat> that is something I would recommend you people read. To be fair, I did go read the articles on his website. 
I wanted to see in particular if he had any serious arguments against the findings of the genetic studies we just looked at. Now, if you were a believer in the out of India theory and new genetic studies came out that contradicted your belief, you could respond in several ways. Ideally, if you are a person whose priority is getting things correct, you would simply update your beliefs in accordance with the new evidence, right? But if you are the type of person whose priority is to maintain your belief, you won't do that. What you'll do is either find a way to make the new evidence fit your belief or dismiss the new evidence. One way you can dismiss the evidence is by attacking the character of the persons involved. And that is what Abhijit does. In a review he did of a book by Tony Joseph, he addresses the 2019 study headed by David Reich and discredits the study by discrediting David Reich. He does this in two ways. First, by claiming that David Reich is a racist. <laughs> That's right. He does this by referring to an article that Reich wrote for the New York Times in 2018 in which Reich was called out by other academics for using language that they felt was dangerous when it came to the idea of race. They never accused him of racism, as Abhijit does. They didn't like how he worded things. And they make valid points. But Abhijit sums it up like this. In other words, Reich revealed himself to be a proponent of the arbitrary, superficial, pseudoscientific, and racist concepts of race and racial differences, which derive their origins in pseudosciences such as phrenology and dubious classification schemes. This is false, as anyone who reads the article would know. But even if Reich did believe in the concept of race, he doesn't, which is why he puts the word race in quotes, how would that invalidate the science presented in the paper, which isn't based on race? It wouldn't. And yet, Abhijit clearly is trying to persuade the reader that because Reich is guilty of academic racism, the study, in which over a hundred geneticists were involved, can't be trusted. The other way he tries to discredit the research is by pointing to a New York Times article by Gideon Lewis Krauss, in which Lewis Krauss gives account of some complaints by geneticists about how hard it is to get genetic research published, and that the field is dominated by four big labs, and that they believe people like David Reich are being shown favoritism by science journals. None of that has any effect on the reliability of the study we're talking about. But in Abhijit's list of the claims that the article makes, he writes the following. Reich is shown to repeatedly arrive at broad, grandiose, sweeping conclusions about ancient migrations, invasions, and wholesale replacements of one population by another on the basis of flimsy and dubious evidence. In one case, on the basis of a single sample from a single island, and often uses different, unrelated, arbitrary population groups as stand-in proxies for modern populations whose DNA samples he is unable to procure. This is a gross misrepresentation of what is in the article. In fact, the words broad, grandiose, and sweeping appear nowhere in the article. Neither do the words flimsy and dubious. Neither does the word repeatedly. These are Abhijit's words. The article is concerned with a specific study, with specific issues, that a couple of reviewers, a minority of the reviewers, had problems with. The critiques were not about the India study at all. And then here Abhijit provides a quote of the article. Reich's team makes disproportionate or even wholly unwarranted claims on the basis of both the archaeological and genetic evidence it provides. This is another highly dishonest representation. These words were used by the objecting reviewers of that specific study, not the India one. But notice how Abhijit puts it in the present tense. Reich's team makes, as if it is an ongoing problem and not referring to something specific. So that is how Abhijit deals with the science that he disagrees with. This is ironic because in his 2017 article that he's asking everyone to read, he writes, Science is not concerned with narratives, ideologies, beliefs, dogma, or opinions. Science deals in empirical or measurable evidence and in hard facts. Conclusions are drawn based on scientific evidence and can change in the face of new evidence. Has he dealt with the empirical and measurable evidence in the latest papers? Has he shown a willingness to change in the face of new evidence? Or has he dug in his heels and looked for any excuse not to consider the science that contradicts the narratives, ideologies, beliefs, dogma, and opinions that he holds dear? I'll let you be the judge. There is an illuminating chapter in David Reich's book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, 
in which he talks about how the DNA research on India came together. I recommend you check out chapter 6. One of the things you will come to realize is how much Reich wanted to get it right. Two Indian geneticists, Lalji Singh and Kumarsami Thangaraj, were key figures in the research, and they had not been fans of the idea of Indo-Aryan migration into India. But they worked with Reich, helped devise the terms Ancestral North Indians and Ancestral South Indians, and ultimately agreed to have their names on the papers. So, when Abhijit talks of the lack of credibility of the studies with Reich's name on them, he is also disrespecting the work of Singh, Thangaraj, and all the other Indian geneticists that contributed. Now let me show you something else, right? Something, uh, something that's a little more interesting. So these Yamnaya people that we spoke about, we spoke about these Yamnaya people who invaded Europe. They, their facial reconstructions were done. They found uh, they found these skeletons of these Yamnaya invaders, and this is what the reconstructions look like. As you can see, these are reasonably European looking people, right? Tall, strong, sturdy. Look at the face. It is a European looking face. This is another one. Another European looking individual, young man, strong man. Look at this person, European looking person. But these are all ancient uh, reconstructions from many, many years ago. Today, with more genetic information, with more genetic data, we know more details about these invaders of Europe. We know what was their skin color. We know what was their hair color. We know what was their eye color. And after knowing these, more, these additional details, newer facial reconstructions have been done of the men who changed the genetics of Europe forever. And this is what their reconstructions, accurate reconstructions look like. Take a look at this guy. This is an individual found in Volgograd Oblast, Russia, Yamnaya culture, Bronze Age, about four and a half, five thousand years ago. This is an invader of Europe, invader of Russia. These are the people, these are the ancestors of today's Europeans. This is one individual. Here is another individual. This is from again from Volgograd, Volgograd Oblast, Russia, Yamnaya culture. This is a third individual. This is from Astrakhan Oblast in Russia. These are all Kurgan burials, grave uh, Yamnaya graves. These are the invaders who are the ancestors of more than ninety, um, more than ninety percent of European men today. These guys, and here is a composite of these three. So, my friends, please tell me something. If you were to see these fine gentlemen walking on a street today, what is the first ethnicity that would come to your mind? Do they look like Russians? Do they look like Ukrainians? Do they look like Swedes? Do they look like Europeans? Do they look like Africans? Do they look like Chinese? What ethnicity comes to your mind when you see these fine gentlemen? To my mind, there's only one ethnicity that comes to mind. These guys are, Euro are Indians. If you see them today, they would. the first thing that would come to your mind is that these guys are Indians. So we are looking at images created by an artist named Philip Edwin. Obviously, these aren't photos the Yamnaya people took of each other. This is Philip Edwin's interpretation of the Kurgan appearance based on earlier art. He is an independent artist, not a geneticist, not an archaeologist. I don't see any indication that he consulted with specialists before creating these reconstructions. How can artistic interpretations be used as proof of what the Yamnaya people look like? And besides... It looks to me like the artist is deliberately trying to make faces that look like a combination of South Asian, Central Asian, and European characteristics. But again, this is not science, it's art. So these are this is what these invaders of Europe looked like. They invaded Europe from the east 5,000 years ago. It was a violent, barbaric invasion. These were young horse riding men, average six feet height, strong, muscular, and they just rampaged across Europe and changed the entire genetics of Europe. They killed every single, every last European man. And they took the European women as their wives or partners. And today's Europeans are descended from these fine gentlemen. So tell me now, which version of the invasion theory is correct? Wait, on the one hand, he seems to be making a dig at Europeans for being descended from these men. But on the other hand, he's identifying these men as Indians. Is he trying to say that it was Indians who violently invaded Europe? I'm confused. 
So basically, what have we determined here? There are three competing theories on the question of the origin of Indo-Aryan languages in India. On one extreme, we have the Aryan invasion theory, long debunked, which was once a scholarly consensus, but because of acquired evidence, no longer is. On the other extreme, we have the out of India theory, which is an invention of non-experts and has never gained any traction among the world's scholars because it is based on pseudoscience, pseudo-history, pseudo-archaeology, and pseudo-linguistics. And then between them, we have the theory of Indo-Aryan migration, which is the current scholarly consensus view across the entire world and across many fields of study. Now, one trap that we could fall into is to begin rooting for a theory, to pick a team and to root for that team. But this isn't sports. When the fight is more important than the facts, we know we've gone too far and need to reassess. When trying to figure out what really happened in history, we need to look at evidence from all angles, archaeology, history, linguistics, and genetics. And we ask ourselves, not, do I have to believe this if I don't want to? Or, can I believe this if I want to? But rather, what explanation best matches the facts that we have assembled up to this point. This video only examined the genetics, but one thing we have learned is that R1A probably originated in Central Asia, and that there is evidence for the spread of Central Asian steppe ancestry into South Asia in the first half of the second millennium BCE. Now, this doesn't prove that the people from the Central Asian steppes spoke an Indo-Aryan language, but it does show a migration into India within the last 4,000 years. And it provides a plausible genetic explanation for the entry of Indo-European languages into India. Moreover, we have seen that evidence for an out-of-India theory is lacking on the genetic side. The studies that posited a South Asia origin for R1A1 admitted that there was a lack of necessary genetic information in order to know for sure, and when that information was gathered, that conclusion became untenable. And the argument that there is greatest diversity of R1A1 in India is also insufficient to establish India as the place of origin because population density may be the cause of this diversity. So I ask you, viewer, what explanation do you think most aligns with the genetic evidence? If you think I have left something important out or I made a serious error, please let me know because I'm interested in getting this right. But I ask you kindly to leave political or racial comments out of it. If you're interested in ancient Indian history and don't know much about it, and you're looking for some decent surveys, I recommend A History of Ancient and Early Medieval India by Upinder Singh and The Penguin History of Early India by Romila Thapar. I'll leave links below so you can find them. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to support the work I am doing, please consider becoming a patron of the channel for as little as $2 per month at patreon.com slash worldofantiquity. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.